I could tell you all about uh, the biography of Professor Hani Farid from UC Berkeley, professor of electrical engineering and computer science. Um, I'll be very brief there, and this is my favorite intro because I can tell you um, a little bit about uh, what I know about Hani personally, um, having interacted with him quite a bit and privileged to have done so. Um, Hani is someone who tells it like it is. If you've seen his media appearances or spoken with him, um, he has strong feelings about everything we've talked about today, and he will be happy to tell you about them um, without mincing words. Um, I think it's fair to say in, in full respect that Hani Farid is the grandfather, maybe the father of digital forensics. I don't want to make you feel old. Um, but there's really, a, you know, he is um, he is the creator of so many amazing technologies um, in concert with so much uh, industry and other academic institutions. You know, among them is uh, PhotoDNA, which is very well known, uh, worked on in concert with Microsoft several years ago. Um, his dedication to fighting the spread of child sexual abuse material, terror images, and other things that are harmful through the use of a, just a, an incredible depth of technological understanding of how Photoshop works, about how image processing works, um, video and deep fakes, uh, and um, just an incredible depth of knowledge. Um, Hani is someone that is easy to talk to. Uh, he wears his passions on his sleeve. I'm very proud to say that among those passions is the work that the CTPA and the CAI do around digital provenance. Um, He'll talk uh, openly about the cat and mouse game of detection and how we might eventually lose it, um, and that we need other kinds of countermeasures. Uh, I'm very proud to count him among our um, very trusted and valued CII advisors. Um, so I was delighted when Hani agreed to give our closing remarks. He's working with many of you in the audience and very focused on uh, progressing the CTPA mission. Um, very proud to introduce Hani Farid to give our closing remarks. grandfather. Man, that hurt. <laughs> we'll talk about that later, Andy. Um, I realize I'm standing between you and cocktail hour, and that's never a good place to be, so I will try to stick to my 20 minutes. Um, I'm not a hockey fan, but I love this line by the great Wayne, Wayne Gretzky, which is, I skate to where the puck is, not where it's been. Um, and I think technology is very much like that, and what makes that line so difficult is technology is accelerating. Um, uh, ChatGPT went from zero to one billion users in one year. That's insane. <laughs> um, but we need to keep our eye on where the puck is going, and that's why I want to spend the first part of my talk talking about, and then I'm going to wrap up a little bit with some thoughts about um, where this is all going. Um, so um, where are we in terms of deep fakes as we look into the horizon? You've heard a little bit about LoRa's low-rank adaptations. So we know that we can do text to image. We know that you can go to Dolly or Stable Diffusion or Midjourney or Adobe's Firefly um, and type in, give me an image of a car exploding, and it will do a pretty good job. LoRa's are things that sit on top of that, these lightweight little processes that now highly specialize the type of image that will be created. Non-consensual sexual imagery, you've already heard about that or this website, which will do only explosions. There's literally a website out there that built a LoRa on top of Stable Diffusion to make highly realistic images of explosions. And that's two images um, that came out of that. And that adds a whole new level of complexity because the photorealism of these are going to become increasingly better and better and better and pass well past the Uncanny Valley. Um, Okay, uh, we have text to image and text to video is coming. In fact, I think it's coming much faster than I even anticipated. Let me show you this video from this uh, company called Runway um, where they're gonna highlight uh, the bird and then they're gonna type in what they want the bird to do and it's going to start animating. And so text to video is coming where it will no longer be, give me an image of President Trump being arrested by the FBI in New York City, it will say, give me a video of President Trump running down the street being chased by FBI, and you will get now full-blown videos of this, and it will just be literally type, uh, a, a, a prompt away. And this is coming, it's gonna come in the next year or so, as I, as I predict. Uh, voice cloning is getting very good. Um, I have a service that I pay $5 a month for, and I can upload one to two minutes of audio of anybody speaking, and I can clone their voice, and I can type, and have them say anything I want. Uh, this is, you're gonna hear the voice of Anderson Cooper in a second. Um, it was generated from about five minutes of audio that we just took from a YouTube channel. So have a listen to Anderson Cooper.
Can somebody uh, forward the slide for me? Here we go. Oh, we need audio. Can we try again? All right, I'm gonna go back. Let's try one more time. All right, this sounds really good, but you can't hear it. <laughs> Are we gonna be able, because the, the, next, the next slides won't work. Can we get the audio working? All right, we're gonna try one more time? Okay. The clock's still ticking, by the way, just so you know. <laughs> All right, can I go? Hold for one second, okay. So while, while, while they're waiting to do that, um, I will tell you that um, we have been doing perceptual studies where we have people listen to cloned voices and it is almost indistinguishable at this point. Um, so the audio cloning is getting very, very good and what has happened over the years is the amount of audio that I need to clone a person's voice has gone from eight hours from a few years ago to now one to two minutes and soon it will be 30 to 60 seconds. Uh, let me see if we have audio yet. Um, otherwise, I'm gonna move on to the next few slides. Okay, all right, so, um, so let's see. So we did uh, uh, text to image, uh, text, uh, text to image, text to video, audio cloning. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the deep fakes. Um, while I do that, I'm gonna introduce Maddie, who's sitting right there. He's the one who's, gonna, who's been doing a lot of the work. What's really amazing about what I'm about to show you here is Maddie is a freshman here at Stanford University. Um, and he's done um, all of this over a summer project. So this is not full-blown Hollywood studios and hundreds of engineers. This is one very talented, but one student working over the summer to do this. All right, let's go ahead and try it again. Okay, here we go. Good evening. In tonight's episode of The Whole Story, we'll cover recent developments in artificial intelligence, mainly focusing on the dangers and risks ahead of us. Okay, so that was an AI cloned version of Anderson Cooper. And if you ever heard Anderson Cooper, it sounds really good. And if you haven't heard Anderson Cooper, you should at least recognize that that sounds very human-like. Um, it doesn't have that tinny uh, voice that you're typically hearing. Okay, so now let's go on to video. So now, not only can I clone Anderson Cooper's voice, uh, Maddie spent the summer working on creating a full-blown deep fake version of Anderson Cooper, where we take stock footage of Anderson Cooper, we clone his voice, and then we combine the voice in the video. So go ahead and watch and listen to this. Good evening. In tonight's episode of The Whole Story, we'll cover recent developments in artificial intelligence, mainly focusing on the dangers and risks ahead of us. In preparation for this episode, we spent a lot of time with Professor Honey Farid of UC Berkeley, a leading expert on media forensics and synthetic media, and having spent a week with him, let me just say, what a dipshit. <laughs> The best part of this is Maddie called me into his office one day. He goes, here, listen to this. <laughs> so, you know, not perfect. If you look very carefully, you'll see a few places where the mouth slips just a little bit. But no kidding, this is, you know, running open source software on a laptop uh, over a period of a month. So again, where is the puck going? This is soon going to be indistinguishable. And it is getting very, very good. Okay, uh, face swap deep fakes. Um, that is me right there. Um, one of my favorite things to do these days is to put my face into movie trailers. I'm gonna play this video in a minute. Um, I don't know, it's a weird pastime, but there you go. Uh, this is, I'm gonna tell, before I show you this, I'm gonna tell you this is running on my laptop. And what I did is I took a video clip from uh, the Sherlock uh, uh, trailer, and I took a single image of myself, and that is it. And I said, please replace uh, this person's face with my face, and the whole thing is running on my laptop. Let me go ahead and show you what it looks like. The name is Sherlock Holmes and the address is 221. Okay, so sorry about that. <laughs> really woke everybody up, didn't it? Uh, so again, a single image of a person is all you need now to insert them. So let me come back to that discussion we've been having about non-consensual sexual imagery. This is not the Scarlett Johansons of the world who are falling victim to this, who maybe you needed hundreds and thousands of images. This is a single image you can pull from the internet, whether you posted it or not, and you can insert that into any video and it is getting very, very good. Okay, now, what's coming next is even getting more interesting. So this is a video call I had with one of my former students, Elliot. Uh, that's him on the left, this is me on the right. And I just recorded my screen. No funny business here. Go ahead and watch the video and I'll tell you what he did. All we are is dust in the wind, dude. 
So in real time, at 30 frames a second, he's doing a face swap deep fake um, with Keanu Reeves' face. Um, and that's running on his, on his desktop machine in his home, and I was recording that. So now, not only is it the text, the audio, the image, the video that you see online, it's the Zoom calls that you're going to take. You're gonna start wondering, is that really who it is? I'm actually excited about this technology because it means I don't have to go to meetings anymore. Maddie will take all my meetings for me. Um, so now real-time video is going to be here very soon. Okay, so um, we've been spending most of the day talking about threats. I don't have to tell you what they are. They are very real. These are not hypothetical. In Slovakia, you saw interference with the election uh, days before where deep fakes were, were um, released and four percentage points um, cause and effect unclear, but we saw a shift in the polls that eventually led to a far right pro-Putin candidate in Slovakia's election. You've already been heard about the non-consensual sexual imagery. You're hearing about news anchors, uh, likenesses being co-opted to do everything um, for hacking cryptocurrency to uh, crackpot uh, medical uh, 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 cures, and then, of course, uh, whole new waves of frauds from phone calls that people are getting and their loved ones' voices um, to um, uh, uh, all kinds of videos that people are showing up on TikTok. So this isn't, this isn't a hypothetical. We're seeing this on a, on a daily basis. Uh, and I don't have to spend too much time on this because you've been hearing about this all day. And so let's talk about what, how, what the interventions are. And you've heard a lot about it, and I want to mention two things on the passive detection side, because most of what C2PA and CAI, and, and I'm excited about this technology, is dealing with how do you deal with the stuff at the source? But as, as Matt Turek told us from DARPA, is there are still going to be holes in that system. And I just want to mention two quick things that we've been working on. So one of them is that although the visual perception of deepfake videos are very good, they are not always perfectly matching the, visual, uh, the physical world. And you heard Matt, Matt talk about this a little bit. So for example, down here in the corner is the screen grab of where um, the actor was saying the S in street. And when you say certain phonemes like street, um, your mouth has to take a certain shape. And you can see that he's starting to enunciate street by his lips pursing together. That's me in the face swap where my mouth is not quite formed yet. And so there is a correlation between the shape of the mouth, we call this a vizim, and the, what is being spoken, the phoneme. And Shruti Agarwal, who's probably still somewhere here, a former PhD student of mine, did some work on matching the two and making sure that they are formed right. And we can find slight inconsistencies that emerge when the lip sync deep fakes are made. We also are uh, developing techniques that can look at any face in an image and determine if it's GAN generated or diffusion generated or face swap generated um, and only looking at the face region so we can analyze images and video. Uh, these things are starting to work with very, fairly, fairly high accuracy, but we are dealing with a ton of content. So I think these are nice solutions on when the C2PA and the CAI standards fall through the crack. I think we're going to have to continue to develop them, but we are going to have to do more than just being able to wait until things hit the internet. Now, in the past, um, I've been thinking a lot about these passive techniques, and these days I'm thinking about how they all come together. So we've been hearing a lot about C2PA and CAI. Let me just, I call these active techniques. We actively interject ourselves at the point of recording on a camera or at the point of creation of a synthetic media, whether that's a firefly or a mid-journey or a stable diffusion or a voice synthesis or a video synthesis. And we've got the passive detection schemes. I think all of these have to come together. We can't rely on any of them. And we probably need some other things that I haven't thought about yet. Um, now, you got to ask yourself, like, what, what's the incentive for a company that generates AI-generated content to comply with uh, uh, watermarks and C2PA? And this is what I've been thinking a lot about. And in my younger days, my, my answer would have been, well, beat them over the head into submission until they do what you want them to do. Sometimes that works, sometimes it doesn't work. As I've gotten older, apparently at the grandfather stage now, thanks again for that, Andy, uh, I've started to think about aligning incentives. Um, so, I can ask the companies don't be evil and just hope that the companies will do the right thing. Eh, sometimes that works, sometimes it doesn't work. Uh, we can create liability. The US government, the EU, can put liability in place that tells the company when you knew or should have known that you did something wrong, we are gonna sue you back to the dark ages. That can work. Um, same with regulatory pressure. We can put public pressure. Advertisers can put, put public pressure on it. And we should do all of those things. 
We should demand companies be uh, responsible. We should put liability, we should put regulatory pressure, we should put pressures on the companies. But I also like to try to align their incentives with my incentives. Um, that is, how do I get an AI generation company that is creating this content to want to detect this content? Not because it's the right thing to do, not because they're being threatened to be sued, but just because it's in their own interest. And this is what I've been thinking a little bit about. So over the past summer, in addition to Maddie making videos of me, of Anderson Cooper calling me a dipshit, uh, we've been working on other things trying to think about what is the right incentive here? And so let me just spend a few minutes talking about this because I want us all to be thinking about aligning incentives. This is my new way of thinking about getting everybody to do what I want them to do. So on the top here, what I'm showing you is we took a standard build of stable diffusion, text to image generator, and we retrained it. Think of it as sort of a LoRa on just a bunch of face images. So all we did was give it like thousands of images of actual real faces. And what I'm showing you from left to right is one iteration after another iteration after another iteration of refining the stable diffusion model and then generating images from the model. And you can see over time the model is perfectly happy. It's generating highly photorealistic images of people. And so we have the ability to retrain these models to create very specific images of individuals. Now where this gets interesting is if you think about the modern generative AI systems, they've all been trained on human generated data. Right, scrape the internet, both legally and illegally, for text, images, video, and audio, and ingested all of that content. But what is happening now is if you go on the internet, there's a lot of synthetic content out there. And we don't know what's what, because we don't have C2PA and CAI as part of the standard around the world. And so what that means is that the next generation of AI-generated uh, content is going to start to ingest its own young. So, in the very bottom row, I'm, and I'm sorry, so these, these images have started to give us a little bit of a nightmare, so I'm sorry if this is going to happen to you too. On the bottom, what we did is we retrained the same model where 25% of the data was AI-generated images like the ones you see on the top, which, by the way, look perfectly fine. There's nothing wrong with them. But for some reason that we don't fully understand, as it starts to ingest its own young, the model starts to collapse and produce really bizarre like you're on LSD type of uh, images. 25% uh, of the data is poison, 10% of the data is poison, 3% of the data is poison, you still start to get model collapse. If you are an Adobe, a stable diffusion, a mid-journey, or a dolly, you had better be, know what you are re-ingesting into your models, or this is what's going to start to happen. Now, what's really interesting too here is that it generalizes, so everything we, I showed you there is the prompts that we were retraining on were only faces of people across different genders, across different races, across different ages. And so we thought, okay, maybe we just broke the model's ability to generate faces. But then when we try to create images, bottom row, where 25% of the model has been poisoned on AI-generated images of faces, to arbitrary captions, you can see that they continue to collapse. You get those same weird patterns, maybe not as salient as before, but the whole model starts to collapse, not just in the category of what we are retraining on. And that is going to be a real problem for these generative AI companies. Now here's the last bit about this whole thing that is surprising, is that it's very hard to heal the model. So we thought, all right, we've poisoned it for five iterations and it's collapsed. Now let's try to get it back to where it belongs. So let's start retraining only on real images for one iteration, six, another iteration, seven, another iteration, eight, nine, and 10, five more iterations. And you can see that on the sixth iteration, everything is still pretty broken. Seventh, everything is broken. Eighth, everything is broken. And by iteration 10, a few of the images are okay, maybe on that third row, but you're still seeing remnants of the model collapse, which means once these models collapse, it's going to be very, very hard to get them back to where you want. And again, it doesn't take a lot of poison data. Uh, and this is not just true of diffusion. People have shown this with GANs. They've shown this with LLMs. And so as these models start to ingest their own young, this is what's going to happen. And that's good news for us because it means that we can incentivize these companies that when they produce synthetic media, they are highly incentivized to know what it is, and they should also be highly incentivized to know what's real so that they are ingesting real content. Okay, uh, three minutes left, excellent. Um, so where is the puck going? 
um, the ability to create highly realistic, visually compelling images, audio, and video is accelerating. Um, we used to measure changes in this field in years. We now measure it in weeks and months. I mean, no kidding, every few weeks we see advances in this technology. And most of what we are doing, everything I've shown you here is all open source. Uh, if you want to know where the action is, go to Reddit, go to Discord, go to GitHub. This is where all the action is. Um, very talented young people, mostly young people around the world developing this stuff. Some of them have bad intentions. Some of them are just being young and naive. Um, this stuff is getting very good. It is all running on laptops now. You don't need a lot of computing power. And so we are entering that time where we are passing through the uncanny valley. And we have to recognize that. And our ability to distinguish perceptually the difference between real and fake is quickly vanishing. That means we need lots and lots of different approaches to detect manipulated media for the purposes of anti-fraud, disinformation campaigns, and a long list of what you've heard. Um, I am actually optimistic about this. I think the difference between today and 20 years ago in the early days of the internet is at least we are talking about the harms. And you can't say that about the early days of the internet. In the early days of the internet, we were all just burying our heads in the, in the sand, hoping for the best. And I think the conversations we are hearing now are very encouraging. I don't think we have all the answers. I don't think we have all the solutions. But at least we're having the, the conversation. And I think that's a huge part of uh, the solution. Uh, I want to thank Adobe for bringing everybody here and to the folks at Stanford, particularly Brian Wendell and, and Joyce uh, Farrell, who helped organize this whole thing. Thanks so much for having me. Uh, and I'm going to stick around for a little bit, and so I'm happy to chat in, uh, uh, afterwards. Thanks, everybody.